Amy, my name is Adele Barnett Lissick, and on behalf of the San Antonio Mennonite Church and our pastor, John Garland, I would like to welcome you to our building. The Mennonite Church is so proud to host the Peace Initiative, and we're glad to offer space for the community to confront the issue of domestic abuse. A number of our own congregants are survivors of domestic abuse, and we know that it touches all parts of our society. We should all have access to the tools and understanding we need to confront this violence in our community, and we should be able to talk frankly with our political leaders about the policies that will most effectively bring about healing. So I would like to thank uh, Congressman Castro, Congressman Doggett, Martin Lives of the Family Violence Prevention Service, District Attorney Joe Gonzalo, Gonzalez, Sheriff Salazar, and Chief McManus um, for being here this evening and for participating in this conversation, and welcome once again. Good evening, buenas tardes. It's okay. We have Chaparita Devil here. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the San Antonio Mennonite Church and the home of the Peace Initiative. Uh, today, we're going to keep our remarks very brief because we have a lot of territory to cover in a very short period of time, and we're committed to staying on time and on schedule. Um, I, I also want to remind everybody to turn the volume down or off on your cell phones, and um, if you need to use the potty, there's one in the back and there's one back here too, so in case anybody needs to take care of that. Um, I'd like to thank Mother's Demand Action for helping us out with uh, water, bringing us water. And if you have a moment, take some time to go look at our PLSA installation out there that was created by Mom's Demand Action and one of my board members. My board members are here today. Uh, we've got Jay Schaefer present. Would you stand, Jay? We've got Mimi Abrego Sanchez here. We've got Dr. Mary Jo Rodriguez here. Uh, and who else is here from my board? I haven't seen Anyways, thank you, board members, for coming. If you're interested in supporting the Peace Initiative, snag one of my board members because they'll help you right out. Okay, so. Um, let me see, what else do I get to say at this point? Um, it's important also to remember that tonight we are speaking from the fact that the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women put out a report recently that talks about and refers to the issue of domestic violence and informs our community about the condition of women. And so please, Recognize that tonight we're going to focus on women. I know that this issue affects people from all walks of life, and uh, it affects men, it affects children, elders, everybody. But tonight's focus is going to remain on how it affects the women in our community, because as you well know, the women are the mainstay of the familia, and that's what we have to focus on tonight. Um, and. I would like to begin my remarks tonight um, by saying Honorable Representatives Castro and Doggett, District Attorney Gonzalez, Chief William McManus, Sheriff Javier Salazar, all the City Council members present, uh, we welcome you to this historic and critical moment in San Antonio, the first ever town hall on domestic violence awareness. Tonight is a watershed moment as we bring these issues out into the open, not just to talk about them, but also to mark that we decided to own them. This issue is a, as a community and take responsibility for the depth and breadth of the damage that it has done and committing to changing that for San Antonio. Yo soy Patricia Castillo and I'm the Executive Director of the Peace Initiative and PEACE is an acronym that stands for putting an end to abuse through community efforts. 
I started my journey as a social worker and advocate in 79, 1979, and I worked as an intern at a community center at the Bear County uh, Women's Bar Association Legal Clinic, as a community organizer on the east side, as a battered women's shelter case worker, educator, crisis intervention worker, and counselor. I worked at SAPD as their first ever social worker assigned to the sex crimes unit in the homicide bureau. I also worked in the Bear County Jail, and all before the Benedictine Sisters recruited me to come work for them and to form the Peace Initiative with my co-founder, Jane Shaver, who is here with us tonight. The point of me telling you all of this is to share with you that what I saw over time in those capacities was the intergenerational nature of the trauma associated with domestic violence and how Everyone affected, if they're not able to help, to access help at various points, would show up somewhere else in my journey. And they would pass on their trauma to the next generation, unhealed, untreated. Maybe I would encounter them first at the shelter and then later at a CPD when they were in trouble with the law. Or maybe they would be my client in jail. This is truly the legacy of domestic violence and it touches so many lives in this community. Even though I have been on the front lines of addressing it for 40 years, I can honestly say I feel like we're backsliding now. It's like we've gone three steps forward and ten steps back. When VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, was created in 1994, it made a difference. Later, more programs got funded, like the Family Justice Center. And we already had the District Attorney Services, and we already had the Battered Women's Shelter. Um, and even though we were still, we were able to have these better services and were able to more effectively reach into the communities. When immigrant women suffered from domestic violence, we were able to get them out of the shadows of fear and silence and help them for a good, long time. But BAWA has weakened, and we struggle to get it past now. We live today in a climate of intimidation and reproach, where people have more reason to fear coming forward. Now they fear their government as well, not just their abusers. Tonight, you will hear from survivors who will tell their powerful, courageous, and vulnerable stories. I also want to highlight some things that I believe truly need to change about how we respond to domestic violence. Here's my docena of suggestions, plus one pilon. Simplify getting protective orders for battered women. The process is very subjective and depends too much on who, which workers and which judge the victims encounter. Versus those people just following the guidelines and the law. We still turn away too many people at the shelter because there's just not enough room. We need more space. This is also very important that we put too much of the onus still on the woman being battered to get safe, to be safe, and to stay safe. Instead of taking a look at what is it about our community that keeps them trapped and battered. We need to do more evidence-based prosecution. Instead of putting all the pressure on the victim to be strong enough or willing enough to tell their story in court while feeling terrorized. We need to address the genuine fear that many victims have that the witness can be tampered with, threatened, or gotten to. And consequently, many are genuinely afraid to testify. We need to hold perpetrators accountable for their criminal actions. The law gives us agency to do this, and we're not doing it fully enough. We need to change the way we work with perpetrators, away from focusing on solely punitive measures, to approaching it more holistically and therapeutically. Otherwise, the pattern will be passed down to the next generation. There is such a connection among batterers to adverse childhood experiences, which we will talk about later.
call it ACEs, as that they have experienced themselves. We need to increase our focus to include children, elders, bystanders, and witnesses in our prevention work. We have vulnerable people who literally don't speak up or know how to advocate for themselves, and we need to advocate for them to be able to do so. We need coordination among city and county services to be formal, and we need both to be held accountable for addressing these needs, and not just rely on an informal network that meets for one hour on a monthly basis. We need deliberate, effective data collection, like the one we got in that report from the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women about domestic violence in our community that's collected and monitored on a daily basis so that we can understand the scope of the problem. Why people end up dead and devise effective programming strategies and policies and seek appropriate funding for this to happen. We need an ombudsperson at the police department and another one at the sheriff's office who can impartially and objectively listen to and learn from people's experience of the system that we have in place. They then relay gather information to us for those suggested improvements, changes, and efficiencies while only being beholden to survivors of domestic violence. These two ombuds people need to answer directly to the city council, who should monitor and evaluate the system's performance, as well as any other agencies that the city or county funds to ensure their effectiveness. We need to reach and engage males who are perpetrators with culturally relevant, language-specific, evidence-based, and trauma-informed work. We also need to engage men who are living a non-violent way of life, so they serve as examples and role models for the youth and boys here amongst us. And we need to continue reaching out to immigrant women in our community who have been pushed back into the shadows out of fear and repercussion if they come forward, who are also suffering from domestic violence within their family circles. Finally, no longer can we have the luxury of saying this is a problem that doesn't affect us. It affects all of us, and each of us, in our own way, needs to take ownership of it and commit to changing what we can to interrupt this procession of victims and perpetrators that has flourished in this beautiful community until now. Thank you. And thank you, Fabrizio, for your incredible work as an individual and peace initiative on combating domestic violence in San Antonio. My name is Joaquin Gosselin, and I represent the 20th Congressional District, which includes the west side where I grew up, a big part of the south side, and almost all of Northwest Bear County. And I'm very proud to represent us in Washington, D.C. And before I, I make a few remarks, I want to acknowledge some of the other elected officials who were not on stage here, but who were kind enough to join us. And especially tonight, because tonight is mostly about listening and figuring out ways that together, all of us, at different levels of government, because it takes more than one member of Congress or one state legislator or even a district attorney or a council member to change the trend in San Antonio. So first, I want to acknowledge a colleague of mine and Lloyd's in the U.S. Congress, Congressman Will Hurd, who's here with us. Also, a former colleague of mine in the state legislature, and now State Senator Jose Menendez. Uh, we have several judges that are with us. Uh, Judge Monique Diaz. Judge Marco Delon. Judge Rosie Gonzalez. And 
several council members uh, from the city council that are with us. Uh, Councilwoman Anna Sabalov. <laughs> Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez. Jada Andrew Sullivan. <laughs> and Union District 6, Councilwoman Melissa Cabello Pablo. <laughs> and the new Councilwoman for District 4, Dr. Aldeana Rocha Garcia. Councilwoman Villagran. I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I want us to get on to the panel. This is an issue that all of us care deeply about. And I mentioned earlier that the trend in San Antonio is going in the wrong direction. We're all here because this is a serious problem in our city. More than other big cities in Texas like Austin and Houston and Dallas, San Antonio has a larger problem with violence against women. And as a community, all of us have a responsibility to do something about that. This is an issue that I've tried to work on for a long time. When I was in the state legislature, I proposed creating a state database for people who committed domestic violence more than twice, two times or more. Unfortunately, that legislation never became law. But I also was, have been very committed to a place called Visitation House over the years. And my mom has literally spent three decades helping out Visitation House is a Catholic run organization that helps women leave domestic violence situations, helps them transition away to independent living. So there are many different ways that all of us can be helpful. Not all of it is law. Many of us can be helpful as ordinary citizens doing what we can to try to reduce domestic violence. So today, we, you'll see that on the stage, there are folks here who will speak about the different aspects of domestic violence. Of course, prevention, policing, and then punishment and rehabilitation. So all of these things are things that we need to address, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and next, I'd like to welcome up a, a wonderful member of Congress who represents the area between San Antonio and Austin, and that is Congressman Boyd Goddard. not only a problem that affects the district that I serve, that includes where we are tonight, it extends to Brooks uh, Base and out to Our Lady of the Lake, which Joaquin and I share, and then around through all of downtown and the east side, uh, but it is a national problem. In fact, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, uh, about a week ago, uh, a hotline that uh, way back in the Clinton administration, I helped bring to Texas, came out with new data showing that last year was the busiest year they have ever had. 573,000 calls that they handled, a 36% increase over 2017. And uh, we also heard that nearly 40% of Texans, Patricia made mention of this, who are seeking shelter after a domestic, domestic violence incident are turned away due to a lack of resources. So we've got to do more, and especially to do more about the one in three San Antonio women who say that experience some form of domestic violence. These statistics are all very alarming, but one of the things we hope to do tonight is to hear the stories 
that go along with that pattern because sometimes those individual faces, those individual experiences get lost in the huge numbers. We have so many activists here, Rebecca Forrest, who rallied individuals uh, on Main Plaza, Patricia Force, Marta, who we were here with, who does such a great job and an extraordinarily impressive uh, facility out on the west side to meet the needs from prevention uh, to counseling to shelter. Uh, Julia Wayne uh, Rodriguez, who's an expert on this, Yannette Davidson Wolf with Great Crisis Center, so many others. And we did, as Joaquin said, mainly come to listen, to learn, and to see how we can collaborate with our local law enforcement officials and all of you to make things better. Just a quick word about federal action, and Patricia referenced it, but the Violence Against Women Act, uh, which um, has enjoyed strong bipartisan support in the past, uh, faced uh, some significant opposition this year when the NRA decided to score a vote uh, for the, uh, the Reauthorization of Violence Against Women Act as being anti-gun for some reason. Uh, that's because a, there is a provision in the Violence Against Women Act which passed overwhelmingly in the House to close the so-called white friend loophole. Uh, currently, the law covers those who've been married to or had a child with the victim, but they don't cover boyfriends uh, and uh, relationships that are, did not involve marriage. And so this modest expansion grew their opposition, as did uh, the protections that are provided in the new form of Bob Wawa for uh, transgender <coughs> neighbors. Uh, Leader McConnell has said he will not prevent a vote on the House bill in the Senate, but I'm still hopeful that on a bipartisan basis, Jody Ernst and Diane Weinstein are working to try to get something done over there. Uh, I hope we can do it. It has through the years provided a process and some valuable support. I remember working many years ago on a program called Expect Respect, uh, which was directed at elementary school students to talk about violence and preventing violence and not having little boys hitting on little girls. Uh, I think we start at the earliest age, getting the experience of these children, uh, and uh, telling them that violence is not the answer. Uh, so many of the problems we have seen surrounding the president uh, are pervasive on these issues. Uh, they, I think they'll take years to correct, but I'm inspired uh, by the fact that that conduct, that misconduct, has inspired the Me Too movement, March for Our Lives, the Women's March, and others. And I have hope that working together, people of good faith uh, can find better answers than we've had in the past on these problems. So we look forward to hearing stories uh, that we know are stories of suffering, and fear, and tragedy. But we also use that experience to find a path forward. And I just appreciate the fact that so many of you decided to join us uh, in finding and going down that path. Thank you very much. By the way, um, I, do, I do want to remind you that a NowCast essay is uh, live feeding this out to the community. And so if anybody's interested in also seeing it later, it will be available. Thank you, NowCast essay, and to the people who donated to get that done. <laughs> At this point, I want to invite um, two women who came here to give their testimony. Um, and talk about what happened to them. We're going to give each of them five minutes, and they could talk for hours, but tonight we have five minutes to hear their stories and hear how domestic violence has impacted their lives. The first person I'd like to call up is Dr. Lori Rodriguez, who is a professor at uh, Palo Alto College and who has a powerful story to share with us tonight. Mentioned. My name is Lori Rodriguez, and I am a survivor of domestic violence. On the night of August 15, 2015, I nearly lost my life to my then boyfriend. I had told him that I wanted to finally end our tumultuous relationship. This infuriated him, and we began to argue. 
He hid my phone from me so that I could not call 911 for what was to ensue. During the approximately 45 minute ordeal, I was beaten, strangled, dragged, kicked, and even bitten. At one point, he sat on my chest with my arms pinned down under his legs and proceeded to beat, strangle, and bite me. I was absolutely defenseless, defenseless to his abuse. He would alternate between strangling me and beating my head against the floor like a basketball. I saw stars like in the cartoons. As I screamed for help, he covered my mouth with his hand so hard I could hardly breathe through my nose and felt that I was beginning to lose consciousness. He then looked into my eyes and told me that he was going to kill me. And I knew he meant it. The thought of dying in this manner, of how my family would find me, was heartbreaking. I couldn't die this way, I thought to myself. At that moment, I thought of the only defense and chance for survival that I had at that point, and that was to play dead. So I stopped struggling and let him continue to beat and strangle me. He eventually stopped, got up, and immediately went to the kitchen. To get a knife, I assumed. At that moment, because of my determined will to live, I somehow got myself to stand up. As the room spun from vertigo, I grabbed the keys to his truck that were hanging on the key rack. I ran to his truck, but before I could get the key to turn, he opened the truck door. I held onto the steering wheel for dear life as he proceeded to pull my hair, pull me out by my hair with one hand, and pry every finger off the steering wheel with the other. Before he dragged me out, I honked the horn as much as I could for help. He then dragged me by my hair along the Galicia rock in front of the gate. I broke nails from trying to cling to the fence as he dragged me. He then kicked me repeatedly on my legs and abdomen as I begged for my life. Please don't kill me. You don't want to do this, I pleaded. He then continued to drag me back into the house. During this time, I screamed continuously for help for neighbors to hear me, but no one heard. I knew with everything in me that if I got back into the house, I would die. As he dragged me up the front steps, I clung onto the middle railing with my arms and legs. He pulled me by the hair as hard as he could to get, to get me to let go, but I held on for dear life, screaming at the top of my lungs for help. Knowing that he couldn't get me back into the house, he finally gave up. As he left toward the gate, he turned around and said, oh, by the way, here's your phone. And he threw it directly at my face at full force, like a baseball player, but only a few feet away from me. I saw the phone coming and instinctively lowered my head. It hit me only a few inches above my right eye, splitting my head open. It hit me, uh, I had, had, I lowered my, had I not lowered my head, I am positive I would have lost my right eye. Blood filled my eye and I crawled on hands and knees, looking for my phone in the dark. I couldn't find it and was afraid that I would pass out from losing blood, so I ran to my neighbor's house, who then called 911 and an ambulance. My attacker was never detained, and it took two and a half months to finally receive my protective order, during which time he stopped me. I even took photos of him driving past my house and made police reports, but the police simply told me there was nothing that they could do without a protective order. He was charged with family assault strangulation, a third degree felony, <laughs> but he received no conviction. He received deferred adjudication, which means that after he successfully completes his five-year probation requirement, he can expunge the incident from his record, as though it never happened. But I can tell you, it definitely happened, and it's changed my life forever. I am an educated woman, I hold a PhD, I'm a citizen, and know how to self-advocate. I speak English, and at the time of the assault, had no children. I was privileged in many ways. If this was the best case scenario for me, I cannot imagine the experiences of women who are not citizens, who do not have an education, who do not speak English, who have children and are dependent on their abusers for support. As we all know, domestic violence is oftentimes generational and affects entire families and future generations of families. As such, this is not a woman's issue, but a community issue. Thank you, Congressman Gastro, Congressman Dyer, for convening this town hall to shed light on the systemic issue that has affected, afflicted our community for so far too long. By the grace of God, I survived to tell my story, one that I hope will help to shed light on how broken our system is and encourage us as citizens to finally stand up to do something about it. Thank you.
Next, I would like to invite Ms. Rena Costello to tell the story of her teenage daughter.
Why would she go near him again? You see, Erin was full of compassion, and she thought if she showed someone enough love and forgiveness, they would change. She always tried to get to see the good in everyone she met. As the evening progressed, Erin's text phone calls became frightening. Phone calls became frightening. I told her, get out of the car, I'll come pick you up. I can remember her frantically yelling because she didn't know where she was and couldn't get out of the vehicle. She had no idea where she was. As I listened on the other end of the line with my keys in my hand, I was out the front door with nowhere to go. Any parent's worst nightmare. I heard my daughter's horrible screams on the other end of the line. My heart racing, I ran to the neighbors to call 911. While I kept her on the line, aching to hear her voice again. But her screams were the last thing I would hear from her. The police were able to track her phone. They found my baby's body left off Campbellus Road. He had beat her, then deliberately ran her over, not once, but twice. Later I found out these appalling acts of violence were witnessed and not stopped. No one called the police or EMS. I recently came across an article written in the San Antonio Current with a headline Bear County, one of the deadliest counties in Texas for domestic violence. According to this article, in the past few years, the number of women killed by a domestic partner in Bear County has more than doubled and is steadily rising. It's heartbreaking to hear, but I truly believe that through awareness, education, and community outreach, we can make a change. As a community, we must commit to making a change. Erin was so young and naive, she didn't see the early signs of abuse before it was too late. She has inspired us to spread awareness about teen dating violence with a mission to enlighten youth, offer resources, award scholarships, or higher education for those affected by domestic violence in any way. We are determined to help identify signs of any healthy, unhealthy relationship and provide additional support. I believe only through education can we empower future generations. By being here today and sharing your story, her life still has purpose. If as a community we can save one team, one life, then Aaron lives on in each and every one of us because love never dies. stories is triggering and it affects people in different ways. Please, um, you know, get with a friend, take care of yourselves, um, you know, don't, don't let this stuff get to you. It's very, very hard to hear all this stuff. So um, please get with a friend and uh, take care. Um, I would like to introduce some of the nonprofits that we've been working with to address these issues, and we have several representatives here to um, talk to us about the work that they're doing. And um, the first person that I'd like to invite to come up is um, Julia Ray Rodriguez, who uh, is one of the co-chairs alongside um, Marta Pelais of the Bear County Task Force on Domestic Violence. And she's going to address some of the work that we've been doing at the Bear County Task Force on this one. That story is very triggering. It's triggering for all of us who um, work on this um, topic, on this issue on a daily basis. So I want to thank you very much for sharing your story. 
And I want to thank everyone else um, for being here. My name is Julia Rainey Rodriguez. I am the co chair of the Domestic Violence Task Force here in Bear County. Um, Marta and I, Marta Flies and I chair this, and we've been, uh, we created this in 2012 um, to organize the nonprofits, the judges, the community stakeholders to come together and work on this issue. If you are at all familiar with the status of women since 2012, things have only gotten worse. So there you go. So um, one of the things that we have realized is we can come together and we can meet as stakeholders and as people who um, work in nonprofits on a daily basis, but we cannot do this work without the community, without the support of our leaders, um, and without the voices of victims. And so I am here today to thank you all for coming. This is something we have been wanting for a very long time as the numbers increase. I want you all to know that um, the judges, uh, representatives of the district attorney's office, law enforcement, um, nonprofits, we are meeting regularly to figure out where the holes are, um, where the where the deficits are, and where the needs are. But we need to get bigger, uh, we need to get better, and we need your community um, help. So thank you all for being here. Next, I'd like to call up Linda Wilson, who is here to represent Moms Demand Action. And it's very important that we work with these kind of groups because 68% of women who are murdered are murdered with handguns. And so it's very important that Linda tell us a little bit about the work that they're doing. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you especially to the church here. I was at that uh, initial, I don't know initial, but that early meeting that was held when Congressman Doggett called us together. And um, the first thing I think I want to say is there is some light at the end of the tunnel. There are groups out there that work in the issue of domestic violence. There are works out there, there are groups out there that work to solve the issue of too many guns and of injudicious use of guns. And the thing that I'm going to focus on now which is about the issue of gun violence and domestic violence. They are intimately connected, and they are a deadly combination that is very much worsened by America's weak gun laws. We believe that it's time to implement common sense laws at all levels of government to keep guns out of the hands of domestic user, abusers and to save lives. I think the statistics show us why. Access to a gun makes it five times more likely that a woman will be killed by her abusive partner. That's a horrifying statistic. And I'm going to say something that even my friends in the organization don't know. People in my family have been victims of domestic abuse and they have escaped safely and are living wonderful new lives. There were no guns. I thank God for that. Also, we know that half of the female victims of intimate partner homicide in the United States are killed with a gun. In Texas, that's even higher, 65%. And people have already spoken about Bear County leading the way. In an average month, at least 55 American women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. And many more are injured. You know, we forget about that. We have people in our organization who are victims, still alive, in very, very dire situations. Several have been paralyzed and others have suffered all other kinds of um, issues. We know that nearly one million women in the U.S. who are alive today have been shot or shot at by an intimate partner. And you know something? This is very important. Abusers not only kill their partners, 
They often take the lives of family, friends, co-workers, law enforcement officers. That's why it usually takes, if I'm not mistaken, three officers to respond to a domestic violence call. What's more, our whole community is at risk. Domestic violence offenders accounted for 54% of the perpetrators of mass shootings. I think you all remember Sutherland Springs. That was an issue of domestic violence, among other things. So evidence clearly shows that policies that disrupt domestic abusers' access to guns work. What are some of the things that should be done? Congress should close the loopholes in federal gun laws to keep guns out of the hands of abusive dating partners and stalkers. Seventy-six percent of female victims had been stalked by the person who killed them. We need to pass the new provisions within the Domestic Violence, with the Violence Against Women Act. And we appreciate what the representatives have done. Now we need to address these to the senators. If you live here, anywhere in Bear County, your senators are Ted Cruz and John Cornyn. I don't have their phone numbers, but I'll give them to you if you need them. Call them. Um, we also have to have better enforcement of the laws that do exist. The laws are not being uniformly enforced, and we need to have protocols that bring all these laws together and make them effective. Another issue is something called the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. We need to ensure that criminal records and domestic restraining orders are entered in a timely manner and then would be available from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. We applaud the House of Representatives for passing the Bipartisan Background Check Act of 2019 and the Enhanced Background Check of 2019. These are good laws that have moved us forward. Now I'm going to bring up something, and I don't want to put the congressmen who are here, there are three of them, I believe, on the spot, but this is a good moment. <laughs> <laughs> we have a mom who lost um, her loved one and decided that she would run for Congress. Her name is Lucy McBath. She's a member of our organization, and she is from Georgia. She has introduced a bill um, House Resolution 3076, it's an Extreme Risk Protection Order Act of 2019. Fifty-two representatives are already co-sponsored, and we hope that within a timely manner, the three of you will join in co-sponsorship of that extremely important order. So lastly, I want to just mention to you, we are out there, there are other organizations that are out there. If you are ready to do something, you too can become part of Moms Demand Action. I'm a grandmom, there are fathers, there are all kinds of people, you don't have to be a mom. Text, get out your phone, text READY to 64433 or see one of us after the meeting is finished. We're all in the red shirts and that's our key leader. Another Linda, Linda Mata. Now we're going to open, uh, oh no, we have uh, Dr. Colleen Bridger. Dr. Colleen Bridger is going to talk to us. Um, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the Health Department's new strategic plan, um, which has four health priorities that I think um, two of them are really going to resonate with folks here tonight. The first one is adverse childhood experiences, um, and another one is violence. Both of those are a recognition on the part of public health that um, 
these types of complex issues require complex solutions and require solutions that cross sectors, and that's a perfect place for public health um, to become involved. I want to talk for a second, because Patricia set me up perfectly, um, about adverse childhood experiences. Um, I think some of you probably heard me give my longer version of the talk about ACEs and why they're important to our community and to our health department. Um, adverse childhood experiences basically fall into two categories. They can be um, abuse and neglect, or they can be what we call um, household dysfunction. And domestic violence is one of the adverse childhood experiences um, that fall in that category of household dysfunction. What happens when kids grow up with either abuse and neglect or household dysfunction is it changes the way that their brains develop. And it has their focus on staying safe. How can I keep myself from the unexpected dangers that are surrounding me on a regular basis? Unfortunately, what that does is it puts more development in the brain on the need to stay safe and less development in the brain on focusing on the future. It also increases inflammation in the body, which leads to increased risk of chronic disease early in life and through adulthood. So what we have is a public health epidemic that starts in the childhood home. And we know that somebody who witnesses violence, who witnesses domestic violence, is at much higher risk of becoming either a perpetrator or a victim of both of those things. And so if we really want to get in front of this, we need to start working with these kids and help them heal from the trauma that they've experienced in their homes at a very young age so that they don't repeat this generational cycle. So that is the focus of um, Metro Health strategic plan. The other thing I want to mention is that Metro Health and the Department of Human Services are running point on creating the city's um, comprehensive domestic violence plan. Um, this was at the request of um, Councilwoman Gonzalez and Councilman Elias that we come together as a city and put together the plan. Um, part of putting together that plan involves us checking in with stakeholders and we've been working on that. Part of that is a survey that I hope you picked up at the back of the room as you were coming in. If you've completed that survey, please either return it about where you picked it up or just leave it in the queues and we'll come through and pick it up too. But your feedback about what gets included in this comprehensive plan is really important to us. Um, so that, I believe, is my time, Patricia, but um, I'm going to stay with the panel in case anybody has questions and I'll be able to answer about ACEs. Thank you. One of the things we wanted to make sure and do here tonight is to hear from the community. And so uh, at this point, we've got this microphone here at the, at the front, and um, we only have about 15 minutes to hear from the community. So if you're going to say something, this is your time, okay? I will talk fast. Okay. Is it on? Hello? Um, I'll talk fast. I have two items that I want to discuss. I don't know. Is that mic on? I don't think it's on. Can somebody check the mic and see if it's working? Okay. Again, I have two items I want to talk about. Um, my husband abused me on May 16th of this year. And listening to y'all's stories, that's my fear. My fear is that he's going to get the first adjudication. Is going to get dismissed, and then on top of that, he's a firefighter, and it's he's a first-time offender. So that's my fear. And what, what what everybody needs to know is this is a choice they made. They chose this, and there should be consequences for their actions. We, our scars heal. I had to have laser surgery for to repair a hole in my retina. It heals, but the fear is still there. We don't forget. The victims do not forget. We don't forget what we've been through. We just hope y'all don't forget for us. Because it's real, the fear is real. And the other item I wanted to discuss was, the, when I went to uh, apply for my protective order, 
There was a pamphlet that had all these um, information on the back for legal help. I called every number on that list, and either nobody answered, I left a message, and nobody to this day has called me back, or there was a message that said, we're not taking new clients. So my question is, yes, I get it. There's too much violence going on, and we need help. So my question is, and again, I've got solutions. So what if there was a program where there was some grant money or a voucher system where the victims can get a voucher, you take it to any lawyer in San Antonio, and they get paid for an hour. They would be able to pay $400 an hour. I was able to do that, but I'm sure there were several people who couldn't do that. And just to have one hour, that was amazing for that one my lawyer to give you that one hour of advice. Because we're just regular people. We don't know what the law means. We don't know what's next. We don't know what to expect. There's so many questions, and you're having to go through all of this trauma. And then now I gotta figure out how do I get help. So I really believe there's ways we can do this. And I I have sent emails out to people. I'm willing to help whatever programs, signatures, let me know. I will sign up for it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And what I'd like to share is uh, that based on studies that have gone on across the nation, that there are new strategies and new efforts that are making a difference. And we've heard of some of it today. But what I want to point out is that law enforcement, the judicial system, is just the tip of the iceberg. That we need to get all the players that are involved. Not only the health and mental health uh, services, Hospitals, emergency rooms, doctors, emergency staff, social services, prosecutors, judges, public education. As I worked as a teacher, I confronted children that were victims of domestic violence and parents. And I didn't know what to do. Nobody told us what the protocol was. Nobody told us what the appropriate response was. So education has to be a part of it. There's other cities now that are using curriculums. One of them is in California. And it's for high school students. And it's called Coaching Boys into Men. And you can, uh, we could involve superintendents, principals, um, nurses and counselors, clergy, alcohol and drug treatment. As we already seen, the nonprofit are doing a, a very good job. Media campaigns that expose to the public what's happening here in Bear County and what people can do to uh, get involved and help make a difference. What I'm leading to is that there are mechanisms for change. We, we are seeing this and what other cities are doing. At the top of everything is training. People that are on the front lines need to know how to identify a victim of a domestic violence, how to interview them, and how to respond. Thank you, What to do to get help. Thank you so much. We can turn it into the time. Uh, good evening, my name is Marty Bravo. I work for Environmental Defense Fund on air quality and climate change issues. And uh, I sat on one of the working groups for the, the city's development of a draft climate plan. Two things that I learned that I'd like to share with everyone here is that, um, one, that um, there are studies that show that when temperatures rise, rates of violence go up including domestic violence. The second is that UTSA did a study and they found that by the year 2040, we're gonna have an additional 24 days above 100 degrees, 100 degrees and hotter on top of what we have right now. So the data supports that these rates of domestic violence are going to increase. So even with all the great work that Ms. Castillo is doing with the Peace Initiative, with all the great work that Ms. Belias is doing with the Battered Women and Children's Center, with all the great work that Dr. Bridger is doing, even if we support that at the current levels, these rates of domestic violence are gonna to continue to rise. And so we really need to double down on all of the support for, the, for this work that you all are doing. Uh, and we need to really double down on the support that Moms Demand Action is doing for common sense gun laws. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Mario, the rates also go up when the Cowboys lose and when the Spurs lose. At least you taught me that. And that's all based on a very male dominated culture. My name is Rosie Gonzalez. Uh, Stephen Gonzalez, I'm the judge of County Court of Law 13. Myself and Judge Michael DeLeon. <laughs> uh, 
monitor this problem every day. I can tell you from my court to today, I have called over 6,000 cases in my court since January 2nd. We have had 12 trials. And I keep screaming for help from everyone. I do want to thank you, Patricia and Marta, and I want to thank the chief for their letters of support for House Bill 3529, which was signed into law by Governor Abbott two weeks ago. Now, by no way do I want to even infer that resources should be taken from victims. We need more resources for victims. No question about it. But Marta will be the first to point out to everyone, we cannot, it's, it's like if you build it, they will come. If you build more jail cells, those perpetrators will continue to fill those cells. What we need to do is hold the perpetrators accountable and change their behavior. So, thank God for Representative Roland Gutierrez who sponsored the House bill, and thank God for Senator Menendez who got it to the Senate. a way to fund a, a, a drug court within this domestic violence court in 13, and hopefully one day in 7. I'm going to tell you something, and this is the place where I waffle, but I'm going to do it. I hand delivered a request for a meeting and for funding to every single city council person in this city two weeks ago. I hand delivered a request for support and for funding for every commissioner, I have yet to get a call back from a single person. So, I am hopeful that someone will call me back. Yes. I have a copy of the bill that got signed into law for Congressman Castro and Congressman Dawkins. We're asking for a million dollars over a two year period to do a pilot program to show the state of Texas that we need to fund these courts to cut off the spigot of violent behavior toward women and sometimes men, okay? And, but we need to approach it a different way. Those of us who have come from the healthy fields know that if you keep doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same results. Our community needs to do something different. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Judge. This is Kay Rose. Kay Rose is going to tell us about a horrible domestic violence incident that happened on her block. Ms. Rose. My name is Kay, like she said. Um, I live on Belden Street, and on April, April 16th, we were all over the news because the man across the street from us who beat his wife on a regular basis, laid down on the front porch and used an assault rifle, which he should never have had, and killed my soulmate. He was, according to the papers, the police had been out there 18 times in the last two years. That wasn't correct. It was way more than that. We saw him on a regular basis. I got on regular, they knew my name, the police did when they got out, because I lived right across the street. When she would come running out of the house, naked, or only in her panties, or maybe just a panties and bra, but this happened continually, because they would be in bed after doing coke, and when he woke up, he would beat her. I would have to dress her, I would have to stop the blood from flowing, while we were waiting on the police, or if we waited on the police, if they got there before I got to her, they would ask me, hey, can you get a shirt on, you know, or something. According to the papers, he was taken in one time. I don't think he was. 
McManus, Chief McManus, I'm not knocking the police department. I love our police department, okay? But he told us, because they ran their mouth all the time, but you never knew what to believe, that he had an in at the police department and he didn't have to worry about it. So maybe that's something you need to check into. But the assault rifle, they knew he had it. Every time they would come, you could hear one of them say, now we know he's got an assault rifle in there in the gun cabinet. Everybody be careful. But what did they do about it? Nothing. And Leroy, the man that he shot, that died right inside my front door, kept saying, okay, there's no use in him coming out here, because we're not going to do anything until he kills somebody. Well, guess who he killed? Your soulmate. Yes, my soulmate. We just lived together for two and a half years, but the man never raised a hand to me. He had the relationship that all of you women who've been beaten wanted. And Billy took that all away. And they came finally two weeks ago and bulldozed down the dead trees in the house because he burnt the house. He doused it with gasoline and then he set fire to it with himself in it. And he died. Thank God. Because I would probably be in jail because I would have probably killed him. And I'm, I'm being honest. I had, this is how he affects the neighbors. I have had anxiety attacks. I can't sleep at night. And you can talk to any of my friends and family. I'm a tough person. At work, they used to call me the bulldog. But this, I'm having trouble understanding. I want to know why, when the police pulled up and saw him with an assault rifle shooting at the neighbors, they didn't kill him. Their answer to me was they were waiting on the SWAT team. Those policemen didn't own a gun. Why didn't they kill him? Leroy wouldn't be dead. Because I was on the phone with him. Because he called to tell me not to come home. And I said, have the police out there? He said, yeah, they're out there. And all of a sudden I heard a noise which I presume was that phone hitting the floor. And the phone went dead. And Leroy did too. So, and I can tell you exactly what time it was. It was 517, because it's on my phone. The last thing he said to me was, okay, don't come home. I love you. I'll call you when it's set. Thank you, Ms. So that's how domestic violence affects the neighbors and the family and the friends. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ruiz. you so much. Desmond, I also have some other written testimony from some of the other neighbors that I would like to submit for the official record. Thank you so much. I just, I just want to add a couple of things uh, that you may uh, already know. On um, April the 1st, I started keeping track of, by, by newspaper uh, reports, of the women and men who were being killed in different ways. And to this day, we have 12, uh, counting the young, the little boy who was killed over the weekend, 12 people from April 1st to today, to this, this weekend, that have been killed in domestic violence. Now that is, that is a huge number, and if we're going to, I think, beat last year's number, which was 29. I also want to include to you, it was an article in the newspaper uh, on July the 1st, about the issue of people who, who have no documents, and how they are reluctant to call uh, in uh, the police when there is domestic violence going on in their households, because they fear that, of course, they will be picked up and they will be deported. Now, this was done in, I think, believe, I believe in uh, Washington, but I know this happens here. It's, uh, we have 75,000 people, residents in, in the city of San Antonio who are undocumented. And I know it happens here. And so that's another element of this whole issue of domestic violence. So those people who never report just suffer the consequences of domestic violence. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, this is Lily Casuda, and Lily is one of the writers of the, commission, the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women Report, along with Dr. Rogelio Sainz. And Lily also helped me write my remarks as well. Thank you, Lily. Hi there. Just thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. This is so important it's in this city. It's closer to my house. It's it's closer so home. important. Yes, right there. I truly feel, as a person who's not from here, I'm from in Boston, lived in Silicon Valley and Seattle, I don't feel like the city has a handle on this at all. I feel like they've normalized it. And we need to strip it all the way back to bare metal and find out the scope of the problem, which literally people don't know. And I wanted to tell you, because I worked on that report, we submitted open records requests for that report to the county and the SAPD, and the county told us right away, we don't keep those records. And I'm thinking, it's 2019, what do you mean? We had three conversations about it, and they basically said, well, if someone commits an assault or a homicide and it's within the context of domestic violence, we essentially don't mention domestic violence. That is a horrible problem in record keeping. Once I heard that, I have become obsessed with this topic. That report is turned in and I am still bird dying this to try to figure out really what's going on. We're not the only place in the country that does this poorly, but we need to totally pick up our game on this. Um, SAPD didn't communicate back with us, but five weeks later we did get the data that we asked for. It was too late to put it in the report, not that they necessarily knew that's where it was headed. There were almost 9,000 women last year who SAPD considers victims of family violence. My concern here is it's always at least three times as many other people, family members who are killed and injured, children who are left without parents, witnesses and bystanders. We need to do such a better job of keeping records, and we need SAPD and the sheriffs and the nonprofits and the agencies to pull their resources. This is an underreported crime across the country, but it's particularly chronically underreported and not understood well here. And instead, I see what we're doing is we're already racing to throw things against the wall like pasta to see what it's to see what sticks as an intervention without a sense of the scope of the problem. Last week, I was able to pick up the uh, data on the misdemeanor family violence cases that went through the county court system last year. And I put them in an Excel spreadsheet, and both ways I did it, it looks like two and a half percent of the active cases result in convictions. Now, I hope you're as shocked as I am. That doesn't even make any sense. I truly hope I'm misreading that, but that's on an average monthly basis, as well as end-to-end -end for the year. I went out and looked in the research literature about what conviction rates ought to be. A weak one is 45%. A strong one is 98% for a family justice court. If those figures are true, if they're even close to true, that could be part of the problem, people being recycled back into the community without repercussions. Let's pull our resources into it. Thank you. Do we, do we want to hear, does anybody want to respond at all to any of this right now so far? Please look like it. First of all, let me, let me. Grab the mic, sir. Grab the mic, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. First of all, let, let me, on behalf of the district attorney's office, thank you, Patricia, for putting this this forum together. It's very important that we bring this issue out to the open. The reason that we're here is we want to listen to you. We want to we hear what you're saying. Not only am I here, but the chief of my family violence division is here. The executive director of Family Justice Center is here. These are people that are here to help you. With regard to to the uh, the comment about the statistics. There is a, a statewide agency called the Office of Court Administration whose job it is to keep statistics. Uh, they're an agency based in Austin. Uh, they are the ones that are supposed to be uh, keeping records. I would encourage you to reach out to them to see if they can uh, provide those kinds of numbers for you. We are trying, just in the six months that we've been in office, to make uh, this a priority. I have said that. We've increased the number of prosecutors. We've, we've uh, put a tremendous amount of focus uh, on this issue here in Bear County. And I would say, and I'm going to laud the work that 
that uh, Judge Gonzalez has had uh, and Judge De Leon, but they can't do it alone. We need to help them. One of the ways we can help is uh, we're sorely uh, hurting for funding and resources uh, because we don't have the manpower to deal with the problem like we should, but we're continuing to, to fight and continue to do everything we can so that we hope some, at some point in the future we will reduce the numbers of domestic violence. Thank you. This is your district attorney. Sir, for a chief, anybody want to know needs to respond? I, I actually, uh, with that, I've got a bunch of stuff I'd like to talk about uh, what we're doing with the sheriff's office, but I really would. Can we give them a chance to, to ask one of the questions yes. and then kind of address it? Absolutely. Again? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, you guys. Uh, Araceli? Um, buenas noches, mi, no, mi nombre es Araceli Herrera y yo soy una, me gustaría que tener traducción porque yo no sé inglés y también pienso que eso es bien importante en este lugar que debería de haber traducción porque muchas de nosotras no sabemos hablar español y cuando sufrimos violencia doméstica y mandan a los policías no podemos comunicar lo que realmente es. My name, is, my name is Araceli Herrera. Um, I think it's very important to have interpretation services at, this, uh, at these types of events because many of us aren't able to, to speak. When someone suffers domestic violence and the police officers come out, it's uh, extremely difficult to explain what's really happening because uh, police officers aren't always able to, to speak. Due to the language barrier. También quiero decir que soy una sobreviviente de violencia doméstica. Afortunadamente pude salir de eso. Y yo soy una trabajadora doméstica en Pio Casas. I am a survivor of domestic violence. I was very lucky and was able to escape from that situation. Today, I work. Um, I'm a domestic worker, and I need a union of domestic workers. Yo sufrí. Yo sufrí uh, en los trabajos sufrí mucha violencia doméstica, acoso, violada, fui maltratada. Fui golpeada en mis trabajos. I suffered sexual assault uh, at my place of employment. Um, I was mistreated in, uh, in this employment. Por eso decidí hacer esta unión. Uh, yo a diario en mi trabajo llegan las trabajadoras del hogar y cuando tienen confianza llegan y platican lo que les sucede en los trabajos y es tan triste porque acoso violencia sexual en los trabajos es impresionante como esa violencia está en esos lugares tan oculta that's why I decided to form this union um, when the women come together they share their stories and it's incredible how prevalent this is y es muy triste para mí Yo pienso que lo que deben de hacer no es tanto, tanto castigo grande para los violadores. Realmente lo que deben de hacer son trabajos sociales para que la sociedad enferma no llegue a ese grado de la violencia. It shouldn't just be about punishing the perpetrators, but we need a lot of social programs so that these people can understand and find a better way. Gracias a la señora. Porque no, sí, quiero decir esto, por favor. ¿Por qué no? ¿Que ¿De qué sirve que los metan a la cárcel más años si, si las personas ya están muertas? Deben de hacer más programas, ayudarnos. Y nos, por ejemplo, nuestra organización trabaja con un presupuesto de menos de 100 mil dólares y hacemos milagros. Ahí es donde deben de invertir dinero. What good is it to put these people in jail if the victims are already dead? Uh, we need it. We need work on the ground. My organization has a budget of less than a hundred thousand dollars, and we make miracles happen with that. Thank you. 
y también la droga es algo que ha llevado a esta violencia, deben de luchar contra esa droga porque en la calle en los campos todo el camino usted va con el coche y va viendo cómo están vendiendo la droga, ¿cómo es posible que los policías no vean eso? Gracias, Araceli. Thank you. The sheriff wants to respond. Sure, she, um, I'll just uh, go ahead. The last okay. comments have to do with also the low wages that their industry workers re uh, receive. They are really hungry all the time and living in misery. And this is also due to um, the drug. Uh, she said on New Braunfels Street, you can see uh, transactions happening up and down the street, and the surprise that the police doesn't see that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I would like to take one of my bullet points to talk about it now. Señora, yo quisiera invitarla a un, unos eventos que nosotros vamos a tener. Uh, la oficina de Chiriquí del Condado de Ecuador vamos a tener dos eventos que se llaman. Uh, se tratan de nuestro programa que se llama Unidos. And I'll translate to this English just a little bit. Uh, nuestro programa que se llama Unidos. Mañana, el miércoles, el día 3, vamos a tener un evento en la Iglesia Trinidad Metodista por 300 San Fernando. Y luego el sábado vamos a tener otra, otro evento identical uh, que va a ser en St. Leo the Great Catholic Church en 4415 South Flores. El, el programa de Unidos se trata de hablar, presentar información a la, uh, a la comunidad hispana, de habla hispana, uh, en español. Y los asuntos que vamos a cubrir estas, estas, estas dos sesiones se van a tratar de... Uh, la primera es qué son sus derechos si la, la ley va a parar un oficial de la ley. Uh, pero también vamos a presentar información cómo reportar uh, un delito a la oficina del sheriff o también al departamento de policía de San Antonio si llega a ser una víctima de violencia doméstica. Okay, vamos a dar información, esa información, pero también vamos a dar información tocante uh, cómo qué se puede hacer uh, si usted es un empleado que un, un patrón lo está maltratando físicamente o con el dinero que no le está pagando. Vamos a, a presentar información tocante a todos estos asuntos mañana y el sábado. Si se puede contar con estas, estas, estas personas que están, están sentados enfrente, le pueden dar la información. So I was inviting her out to some uh, meetings that we're hosting with the sheriff's office. Uh, it's called our it's it's our Unidos program. Uh, SAP has got one as well. But we're present. We're having two sessions. One tomorrow night, the third of July, uh, at uh, La Trinidad Methodist Church, 300 San Fernando. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. We're also hosting one on Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, that one's going to be at Saint Leo, the Great Catholic Church, 4415 South Flores. Uh, the topics that we're going to be covering at these two identical sessions will be, uh, first and foremost, uh, what your rights are as a, as a private citizen uh, or as a Bear resident if you're encountered by the authorities, uh, either immigration or uh, local law enforcement. Uh, Maldeth will be presenting that information. We'll also be presenting information uh, to the immigrant community, the Spanish-speaking community, on how to report a crime. I'll be giving information to how to report crimes for us and to the SAPD if you are the victim of domestic violence or any other crime, uh, we are going to be reassuring that public that, uh, look, we are not immigration. Uh, if you are a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime, call us and report it. And we're going to treat you like a, like a victim or a witness. We're not there to, to deport you. So we'll be giving that information as well. But also, we're going to have some folks present some information on what to do if uh, you might, might be an immigrant and you've got a... Uh, a a boss, an employer that is taking advantage of you and not paying your wages. We're going to have some people there that are giving you the information on that recourse. And so we'd like to invite everybody here out to those two events coming up very soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that our mayor, Ron Mirker, has just joined us. Mayor? Congressman Doggett is going to need to leave here in a couple of seconds. And uh, Mayor, if you'd like to join us up here, that'd be great. All right? <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. Now. Yes. Yes, I'm Robert Lee, Solitar Martinez, United Methodist Pastor, retired. I had an incident Sunday night, and I want to know how long it should take when you call about. I um, was in bed watching TV around 10 o'clock. I called because there were five shots fired. I did not know where. It started like my backyard. And I called and 
they didn't come, I called, and they said they didn't have enough personnel. I called, they told me they didn't have enough personnel, and I called, they didn't have personnel. Finally, about a, after an hour, I did talk to my neighbor. I saw my neighbor across the street, and he said he had already reported it as well. But after an hour, I called, I said, I need to talk to a police person. I need to know what's going on. She came, she was very, very nice, but she said, there was nothing going on, and I can't believe nothing was going on. But my question is, what if something else had happened, or you know, been, you know, very vulnerable, or anybody's very vulnerable nowadays? Thank so you, ma'am. I want to know why it took such a long time to respond. All right, thank and you, ma'am. So that's a question. I guess need further up. This happened in the city limits, inside the city limits. It took longer than ten minutes. Did it take? Did it happen inside the city limits? Oh yes. Okay, uh, Chief McManus, would you like to respond? Yeah. Chief McManus? Go ahead. Ma'am, I've got some folks in the back there that will, will talk to you if you would give them the information, uh, date, time, and all that, location, and, and we'll, yeah, we'll investigate that. that. We'll give you a call like back. That okay, thank you, ma'am. You can go talk to uh, Captain, Captain Reyes is back there. But there have been some other crimes in my down my street, and so I don't know what's happening. Now. Okay, Chief Reyes can talk to you about that. No, ma'am. I need to move on to the next the person. The sports community that spends millions and billions of dollars on sports, playing sports. Why can't they spend a few months teaching young men and women how to get along? Thank you, ma'am. My name is Ebony Williams. Um, I am a 27-year-old single mother of three children. About uh, six years ago, June 4, 2013, I lost my one-year-old son to domestic violence. I was going through a relationship where I was abusing myself. I was afraid to talk to people and you know speak out about it. But I would make police reports. And um, they would tell me this is a civil matter because I had to, you know, evict him out of my apartment or whatever. And um, it really didn't make any sense to me how stuck I felt because I'm like, I'm not married to this dude. I never said I do. I don't care what law say, uh, common law. I don't care. I never said I do. I don't have a ring on my finger, and I don't want to be with this man. You know, but he was abusing me, and um, it was kind of like I just kept getting a runaround. You know. So um, I knew he had a case coming up because he beat me up back in 2011. And um, so I was waiting on his uh, trial date for that case, which was kind of my plan to get out of that situation um, because the trial date was coming up soon. But um, before then, uh, he murdered my son. Uh, he beat my baby to death. And uh, still to this day, I still feel no justice. I still got no justice. He's in jail right now for a burglary and theft charge, but he's been out of jail for that uh, assault case towards me. He's been out of jail for like two years already, and they still haven't done anything about my son's case. So I'm very upset. I'm hurt. You know, um, I have insomnia, anxiety, depression, PTSD, all type of you know mental health. Um, issues and um, I'm just I really like I, I'm waiting and trying to be patient and trying to go by the law and trying to wait and see what happens but it's it's unbearable I can't keep waiting like this like Thank something needs to happen something needs to happen Joe is do you have some of your staff members that can talk to her absolutely if you want to, to go to the end of, of the room we have the uh, uh Melly Powers do you stand up she's the chief of our family violence Unit, she can visit with you. Just let me tell you real quick, and, and, and my heart goes out to, to you. I can't, since I wasn't there, I don't know what happened with the prior administration, but there's absolutely no requirement that someone be married. If you cohabitate, if you have a dating relationship, that suffices to qualify as a victim in our family violence or domestic violence division community. Nobody ever has to be married to an alleged perpetrator. And so that, that's what we were told that was misinformation. And, and I apologize to you for somebody giving you. That misinformation years ago. But but I encourage you to Thank talk you. to Ms. Powers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Dr. Clark is gonna be the last one because it's eight o'clock and we have to stop. And and Congressman Castro still has to speak a few words. Go ahead. I'm Ellen Clark, professor of Maritime from UTSA. 
and I, I'm here with uh, three of my other colleagues. We are four community activists that came together and formed Metro in reaction to our mayoral candidate that was running for office because of our extreme concern about such a person being part of representing our city, number one, being a role model for our children, and if elected, would have advocated the issue of domestic violence. So we're an independent group, just four of us. But my questions to you are what I would like to request, because we've heard all of this, all of these requests, all of these demands. What it tells us is that there's no concentrated effort in the Bear County or in our city. We have the Bear County Task Commission Force, which to my understanding is not formal. It's an informal group that's been convened. So I would like to say that our city council and our Bear County commissioners need to come together to make that a formalized organization or whatever, where all of these efforts are concentrated and where the data is clear from every city uh, office and comes in and can be reported fully to everybody. And that all decisions then be conveyed to the community. That's I think was very apparent is our community is does not know where to go for what or to whom and what can they expect. So that's what four women did. We formed METU. In two weeks we had 2,500 women sign up. And so what I would like to request is all of these personal stories that we heard today need to be documented. And we have agreed that we will do this. So those of you who have personal stories, please contact Kathy Sosa, Dorina Roland, and, and uh, Gina uh, is at Eisenberg, or myself, and we will be glad to, to collect all of these stories and have them archived for you in whatever format we have. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Clark. Okay, uh, Dr. Stringer, nice to meet you. And he's going to go do something right at 8 o'clock. But let me just say that Congressman Castro wants to listen to the people that the last group that was lined up. Please join us. He would like to stay and hear your story. The last people that were in line. Congressman, thank you so much. Congressman Doggett, do you want to say anything before you go? I apologize, but I'm leaving my partner, my wife, uh, Libby here, and my staff uh, to visit some more with you directly. We would like to hear more about what has occurred here. Congressman Castro will uh, provide some additional comments about what we can do going forward in trying to build a coalition to address these very real problems. Uh, I think you have put a very human face on a big problem, and we want to work with you not just to find answers in Washington, but to see how we can work with community leaders together with you to solve these problems. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Villarreal. Uh, a year ago, speak louder now. One year ago, the 4th of July, my husband beat and strangled me in front of my four year old child. Um, you always hear, why don't women speak up? Why don't they go? Well, I did go. I did. I went to police. I told them my story. And because my user was smart, because he's worked for CPS, because he has a criminal justice degree, he was smart about his abuse. He didn't leave any marks on me. The policeman that I spoke with said, well, I've taken women out of homes who have these black eyes, and you should be grateful that you are where you are. I have to live with this trauma every day. It's extremely difficult for me to get here right now. Um, I don't like crowds. I have so much anxiety. This right now is so difficult. But I think that we need education with anyone who deals with abuse, victims of domestic violence. A judge also, a new judge, gave my ex-abuser gave him custody. So my abuser has unsupervised visitation to watch on me. Um, when my lawyer said she was strangled in front of this child, 
he did with Glenn she was that she was telling him what time it was. So I think there needs to be education on judges, on police officers. It is not just hitting, it is a systemic breakdown of a whole person. I can't even tell you who I was a year ago. I don't even know who I am now. I just want to be regular again, and I wish that I had more support than, well, we don't have it so bad as somebody in the black eye. So we do need education on my everybody and support for people who go through this like me. Thank you so much. Marta, would you like to say something to, to her with regard to services that are available for people that have been through this? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Patricia. I have here information related to our agency. It is an agency that in a comprehensive manner provides services to victims of domestic violence, residential and non-residential. Um, counseling services for the children, counseling services for the victims. We do um, intervene the perpetrators just as well. And at the shelter, we have legal services, we have a school for the children, we have a clinic uh, for everybody, we have activities, we have programs. Um, what I'm trying to say is, those who come to us, they get served and they get served holistically. The problem is with those who do not reach us. Today, the census at the shelter is 191. Six years ago, the daily census was 68. Today, that daily census keeps creeping up. And the uh, recidivism rate, so that you do not think that these are women coming back and coming back, is 7.43, meaning that only 7% of them, 7.43 of them, return for a second time or perhaps more, compared to 28%, which is the national rate of women that go back to shelter seven times before they cut relationships with the others. So in terms of the services being delivered to the victims that approach the resources that the community offers, we are doing it. The problem is there is a systemic, there is a culture shift that needs to happen in our community. Many times I am asked, where does it come from? What, what, what is the reason today the New York Times called me reacting to an article that appeared in the Express News? They call me and say, and what do you think is the reason for all of that domestic violence? What a question. If I knew, I would put my finger on it and I would address it and I would deal with it. But I did offer one factor that I do know plays a big role in domestic violence and the high incidence in our community. And that is the generational violence. Little children are born with a social template that is blank under their little arms. And the parents or the guardians, the extended family, the environment, the community, the schools, they begin to write little messages on a daily basis on that template. And that child has a complete book of directions of how to relate to one another. And by the age of 15, you have a perfectly formed perpetrator or a victim, because that's what he has been fed in his environment, mainly the home. If the family is well, the community is well. Family is wrong, the community is wrong. That is a very simple concept, and I don't think that there is an argument to that. So this person proceeded to ask, the majority of the people in San Antonio, you have a majority Hispanic, don't you? And I know what he was going to, so I saved him the effort, and I said, yes, it is a Hispanic issue. In San Antonio, it is, because domestic violence follows the demographic distribution. The majority of the victims are Hispanic, and the majority of the perpetrators are Hispanic. So as members of this community, 
those of us who are Hispanic, and those of you who are not Hispanic but who live in this community, I invite all of you to explore what traditions you need to share from your daily life. What ways of living you need to analyze and discuss with your partner, your husband, your boyfriend, and determine that they have no place in your home. Because I can tell you that in our batteries intervention program, when the men first come, one of the first things that they say is, that blippity blippity judge them here, I have nothing to do with domestic violence. I slept my wife. So what? I did slap somebody else's wife. It was mine. So there is a sense, a wrong sense, and a wrong attitude that's playing a role in our community towards family. That needs to shift. The congressman just asked me, do they really change? Yes. It is a tenet of psychology that any behavior that is learned can be replaced by a different behavior. And we need to take that as a marching order. Actions precede attitudes. It's not the other way around. You need to have an attitude towards something before you act. If we change the attitude, if we challenge the attitudes, we will be ahead of the game. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not short term, but we have to start. We have to start somewhere. Because the children, they represent the future of domestic violence. And if we don't do it by the children, we will continue. And the knowledge will continue to escalate. Thank you, Martin. My name is Tina Cisneros Bonnet, and I am a law enforcement professional and a survivor of domestic violence. The previous district attorney office found a way to draw the domestic violence charge of aggravated assault, deadly weapon, that was that my abuser was charged with and arrested, and arrested for. They um, they did not proceed with my case throughout the life of my case, which was three years. Um, no one ever contacted me from the DA's office, and um, my case ended up being dropped for um, dismissed with lack of evidence by a special prosecutor who was good friends with the defense attorney. This person is a retired federal agent who is currently holding a position of power with with Haida with the Haida Task Force as a training coordinator. Hundreds and thousands of police officers come through Haida for training, and this is the face of Haida and abuse. I have, I have written to the executive board of Haida for assistance in, like Judge Gonzalez said, holding them accountable. Holding this person accountable because the law enforcement the biggest law enforcement firm in Bear County could not hold them accountable. I ask that you look into this matter and, um, and assist other victims of domestic violence within the law enforcement community that fear coming out and speaking out because they don't think they will be heard or they would be listened to or anything would progress with their cases if they ever had to come out and <coughs> report domestic violence. I thank you for your time and I appreciate if you would take my letter that I wrote to to Mr. Gonzalez, the DA, District Attorney, Sheriff Salazar, and Chief McManus. I wrote a letter, an open letter to you to you all as members of the board for um, South Texas Haida. Thank you. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things that we also know about domestic violence and law enforcement is that 
Uh, unfortunately, the studies have already been done that indicate that any police department that you ever look at could have up to 40% of their officers involved in domestic violence. So that's something that we've got to be very well aware of as we try to develop our plans and our strategies. Maria. Hi, I'm going to be fast because I want to say a lot. My name is Maria Falcon and I am a licensed professional counselor and I've worked in San Antonio, Texas for 30 years delivering services to victims and perpetrators of domestic violence. I have thousands and thousands of hours of experience in listening to the stories of those that are here, those that are gone, and those that have been changed and those that did not change. Uh, to the point that in 12, 2014, I wrote a research paper called uh, How We Make Your Stay. Stay. And that means us, the professionals, by the way. We're not talking about the perpetrators or the victims in that paper that I wrote. And American Counseling Association has published it. This, I have hope. Uh, victims of domestic violence. In 30 years, I thought that we would have a different language to tackle this problem. I know what the solution is because I've been working with victims of domestic violence for 30 years and listening to them, number one, they are the true experts of domestic violence and not any of us. So we need to listen to those voices and we need to cater the programs around what the victims tell us that they need instead of what we think they deserve or they want. If we listen to them, they will tell us what they need to stay alive. And thank them for being alive is the first thing we have to say to a victim of domestic violence. Secondly, the other thing that we need is to hold accountable the agencies that are receiving funds 30 years and we're more victims of domestic violence and we keep putting it back on the victims. Uh, and even on the perpetrators, probably. I think it's time for us to change the way we deliver services. Women victims of domestic violence are still the number one social group in our community that have not risen up to, to obtain what they truly need, and that is safety. For our next generation, we know what the problem is. We need to know what are we going to do to solve it. I, so one of the things that victims have told me, number one, can we have agencies audited? I personally, as a professional, call those agencies and I get a freaking message that the telephone that nobody answers and nobody uh, calls you back. So what they're saying is true. So maybe we should ask for those that receive public funding that they have live voices taking those phone calls and use that money in a way that a victim has a true person responding to them because this is a life or death situation. There should be no recording when a woman calls any program that delivers services to a victim of domestic violence. The other thing that we need to do is to train every professional. I work too often in agencies that they hire and hire and hire people and I go up to them and say I know nothing about domestic violence. It should be prohibited that anybody is hired that does not have the true training and can demonstrate that they understand the dynamics of domestic violence. When I do my job wrong, Somebody dies, and even when I do it right, somebody dies. I think we need to elevate this to listen to every single victim of domestic violence and get off the excuses that we give them all the time. We need more money, more money, and more money, and more money. We need to do more and more and more and more with what we have. I also hear them say we need to decentralize the services. They're two in one place. If we need more shelters, open up more shelters. We don't all live in one side of the city. We need to open different places. We need to treat perpetrators of domestic violence. But mainly, they need to know that we support them. They need to know that we're for them. And that we <coughs> have to all the time understand that we should be able to critique each other as professionals. As a professional, I've had a lot of doors closed on me because I'm one of those advocates and community service workers that I'll go up to anybody and say, you know what, you're not delivering the service. We just heard here saying that most of the victims are what? Hispanics. But how come most of the services are not there for Spanish-speaking people? Whether it's attorneys, whether it's law enforcement, it's time to change the system. And I think we need to stand up and respect victims of domestic violence and start listening to them so they'll stop dying. Ladies, take over the government system. Start being the leaders of our community. Hi, first of all, I want to thank um, Mr. Castro for letting us um, continue talking. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm here um, to share my sister's story really quick. Um, domestic violence is very real and it's nothing to play with. Some women um, are often stuck and manipulated and don't know how to get out. So with that being said, my sister was in an abusive relationship for many years. And even when she would leave him, and sometimes it would take BCFO a long time to get there, and time and time again, call and call again, they would come and make comments, oh, it's this address again. I don't, first of all, I don't appreciate those comments because a life is a life. And if it was your family member, you wouldn't like that comment either. So I struggle a lot with that. Second of all, it wasn't only my sister that was taken. My sister and my brother were taken. Both shot in the head inside my parents' home, in front of my parents and in front of my sister's seven-year-old boy. Now you want to tell me how you think that kid feels now. He's 14, almost 15, from house to house to house. No parents. And I'll tell you what, he's a darn good kid. For what he's had to endure, he is an amazing kid. I coach him, I take him to church, and I always tell him to keep his eyes fixed on Jesus. When Sutherland Springs happened, I took him out there and I showed him, you're not alone, this happens all the time. So don't ever think that you're alone. I'm very emotional because I didn't come here to speak, I just came here to hear, to listen. So I, I want to know why it takes so long for any officer, whether it's BCSO or SAPD, why does it take so long to respond to the calls? Or why are they not trained enough to say the comments that they're saying? Why are they saying that? Oh, it's not average again. Here we go. That's not, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. Um, it's, it's just not. Now, have they responded to the call? Maybe she would be here. I don't know. But as long as it took these officers to get there, she was being beaten. My family had to endure this. My parents, it killed them. So I didn't just lose a sister, a brother, and my parents, and a nephew who has to suffer. Gun control. I understand we can't always control how people access guns and how they use them. I understand that. We, like you said, we don't have the manpower to do that. I understand they're going to get them illegally or however they're going to get them. And we can't control that. I understand. I was so anti-gun after the murders. And now I'm a license holder. And I won't take crap from nobody that wants to try to abuse me. I will use it if I have to, if my life is in danger. And the last thing I want to say is for people that don't know how to come out and talk, Picture this, we had my sister's funeral, we buried her. We went to eat, we came right back to the same funeral home and buried my brother. So something has to be done. A restraining order to me is nothing, it's a piece of paper because anybody who wants to kill somebody is going to do it regardless if there's a piece of paper. Something has to be done. And I will advocate for my sister until the day I die. I will be here sharing her story and living for her. And I think we, we, something has to be done. <laughs> Is that really correct that happened in 2011? 2011? Well, I can tell you from the BCSO uh, perspective, it sounds like, like that's who handled it. We've come a long way, uh, certainly since then, definitely the past two and a half years since I've been in office. Um, thanks to our, our brand new substations that we just opened up in December, uh, our response times this year uh, are uh, to non emergency calls 12% faster than they were last year. And 911 emergency calls, 18% faster than the same time last year. So we're certainly uh, leap going, growing leaps and bounds with respect to that. With respect to our training, and certainly it sounds like you've dealt with some sensitivity issues, major sensitivity issues, customer service issues. Uh, recently, we've doubled the number of training hours that our deputies spend in in-service training. We went from the state minimum around 20 hours a year to 40 hours a year to mirror what SAPD has did my entire career that I worked over there. 
Uh, and quite a bit of that training, with those extra hours that we added in, we're able to devote to sensitivity, uh, uh, certainly criminal, I'm, I'm sorry, customer service uh, training. But additionally, Mar Marta Perez uh, comes in and teaches a, a great block on family violence. Uh, not just how to handle it. Yes, I mean, every first responder definitely needs to know how to handle uh, family violence. But she's also teaching us as first responders to look inward. Do you have the signs of, of being an abuser? Do you have the signs of being a, a victim? And does it need to be addressed? So we're certainly, all of the points that you made are, are excellent points. Uh, I'm so, so sorry that, that on behalf of the system, it seems like the system let you down. Uh, it built my system. It, abs absolutely. It, 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 it's not, it doesn't bring her back. Yeah, no matter what you take now, it doesn't bring my sister yes, back. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and I, and I, and I, yes, ma'am. I understand that completely. And I, I wish there was something I could say or do to somehow make that better. But certainly, um, if, if you know, we can prevent these tragedies from occurring in the future, I'm certainly going to do everything in my power to continue to, to, to try to do the right things as far as the sheriff's office goes. And I know that, that my partner here to my left is doing the same thing for the SAPD, and certainly Joe's doing the same thing to up, their, up the game at the, at the DA's office for certain. So thank you. Um, one last thing I just want to say, um, and not to, not to be rude to you because I respect you, but every time the news, I watch the news in the morning, there's always deputies getting arrested for doing the same thing. So we're training for that. Well, ma'am, I created a unit specifically for that. Uh, my very first couple of months in office, I created a, a unit called the Public Integrity Unit. Uh, there was no unit devoted to investigating and arresting deputies within my own agency. I created one. I also doubled the size of my internal affairs unit. Uh, wasn't a happy thing to have to do. I could certainly use those investigators elsewhere, but that's an important function, so I doubled the size of that internal affairs unit. So when you create proactive units that are out setting up sting operations and proactively looking for, for police officers or, or sheriff's deputies in this case, uh, committing wrong, guess what? You're gonna find it, and you're gonna find it in big numbers. So I, yes, I can tell you, I've had an inordinate number of, of deputies arrested, and I can also tell you, unfortunately, that number's gonna keep going up because of the proactive nature of, of the way we do things at the sheriff's office. But I can also assure you, and I can promise you this, that every time it happens, I'm gonna act openly with the media, I'm going to act openly with the with the public, and I'm going to stand up there and I'm going to own it, and I'm going to tell you what we're doing to prevent it in the future. I can, I can assure you that. So thank you for bringing that up. My name is and I'm here on behalf of the Christine Mesa Foundation. My best friend was murdered also in 2011. Um, I don't have any questions or anything, but simply an invitation to let you know and those behind me know that on October 5th, we are hosting a 5K to bring awareness of the issues and impacts of domestic violence. So together with Ms. Martha, who is beautifully outspoken at Family Violence Prevention Services, again, we host a, non, uh, excuse me, a 5K called the Purple Run, and I just want to extend the invitation to all of you up there and those that are here in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Devin Salas. Um, the questions I was going to ask were already asked and answered, so thank you, ladies. Um, I'm actually a two-time survivor of domestic violence. Um, I was abused from the age of 18 to the age of 26. Um, my first abuser was, well, he is still my husband. Um, he was in the military at that time, and we had two children together, and my oldest son did witness a lot of the abuse. And it, was, it got to a point where the alcohol and the drugs had just took over to, to the point where he didn't care anymore. So we separated when he went on his second deployment because that was my only way out. My second abuser, we have three children together. Um, again, the drugs had took over that relationship. Um, there was nothing I could do. It didn't matter how much I tried to love them, try to love that out of them, it didn't work, and even trying to get help for them didn't work. Um, my second abuser, he did abuse my oldest son. So my oldest son is eight years old, and he's also a two-type survivor of domestic violence. Unfortunately, CPS had gotten involved, and they had removed my first two kids because my second abuser abused my son to the point where 
I didn't realize how bad it was until I had saw the pictures for myself. Um, so he was on probation for that. Um, he is in jail now for the, uh, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He tried to cut my throat with a kitchen knife in front of our two kids, and I was pregnant with our third at the time. Um, thankfully, I was able to escape, and I ran around the neighborhood banging on all the neighbors' doors, asking for help. Nobody, nobody wanted to help me. They were all saying, no, please go away. You don't want any trouble. My phone doesn't work, giving me tons of excuses. Um, thankfully, a man did come out, and he did help me, and he called the cops for me. Um, it took about two hours until the cops had came to me, and when we went back to the apartment, him and our kids were gone. Um, I was scared I was never going to see my kids again. Uh, luckily, 30 minutes after the police had um, did an investigation, took pictures of myself that was covered in bruises. I had bruises I didn't even know I had um, until I saw the pictures. They took pictures of the apartment, they tore the apartment apart, they put people holes in the walls. Um, Um, 30 minutes after after I had locked myself in the apartment and he was going to come back, the cops actually came back knocking on the door saying that he's here, come get the kids. So thankfully, you know, he came back. But after a year, he finally, he finally got five years for trying to kill me in front of our kids while I was pregnant. But he was on probation for child abuse for my older kids. But they didn't give him the rest of that probation, even though he revoked it. So my question is, I don't know, question, comment, but if that could, if that previous record could get looked into more when an abuser abuses again, I think that would help out so much because I don't feel like my kids were served, you know, their justice. You know, he gets out of jail in five years and He's not going to get the rest of his time. He's just going to go back to being free. And along with that, um, more programs for the abusers, I feel, would make, I guess, a difference. Because us as survivors, we're, we're able to leave, to stop, to get, self for, to get help for ourselves and to help our children that have witnessed it. But the abusers, it continues with them because they don't, they don't stop. They, just, they, they go on to abuse other people. And you're saying, you're, what you're saying is absolutely true, but the other thing that's true is that if somebody doesn't want to get help, no matter how much you give them, it's not going to help. It's not going to make a difference. Just one more, and if, I don't know if there's already a program out there, but if there was a program created for the children that have to live with this every day, and not only that, my four-year-old remembers it like it happened yesterday, he has nightmares about it, he even tells the doctor that my daddy cut my mom's head. <laughs> and he has autism, so it's even harder for us to try and handle that. Okay. So, and he, he shows the, the same aggressive behaviors. Martha's going to talk to you about the services they have at their children's center. Absolutely. All, all, all free of charge, okay? For, for, for you, you need services. It sounds like you could use some services as well. And for the children, okay? So call the, the Family okay, Violence right. Prevention Services. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't really have a question, it's a statement. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's spoken to today because I know that can be hard to kind of relive your trauma. Um, my name is Pearl Gonzalez and I'm a counselor intern at um, Family Violence Prevention Services and I also work at the Children's Shelter which is directly working with the kids who are removed from the home. Um, and so, like Martha was saying, it is generational, and that's a lot what we see there. And when people figure out, like, where I work, what population I work with, a lot of what I get is stigma and microaggressions. Like, why doesn't she leave? Like, she put herself in that position. Um, but at the same time, I feel like we're all here and we're all aware of the issue because that's why we're here, because we want to learn about it and kind of discuss it. But at the same time, there's people outside of these walls that aren't aware of it. So speaking and advocating, not only the people who are sharing the same interests with those who aren't aware, because a lot of people don't know that this is occurring here in San Antonio. And so just to continue advocating outside of these people. Thank you.
Oh, and also we provide um, family services, I mean, services at Family Violence Prevention Services for children as well. Thank you. And I'm Mr. Um, I was 18 when the started, and oh, and then uh, my husband would uh, kick me with toe boots and tie me up and gag me so nobody could hear. And then I couldn't eat anything past five. If I just cooked before five, then I was I couldn't eat at all. So he would eat, but I couldn't. And then I, I would uh, try to go at night, try to get something, catch me, he would catch me, and beat me up again. So, but I did it, I mean, that's been for a lot of years. But he didn't win because I didn't let him win. Now I'm myself now. And nobody, not, not one single man, can put you down like he did. Nobody. I mean, I survived. And I, I want to tell everybody else, if somebody, and you're going to abuse like I did, get out. Get out. There is there's no time to get out. Because I'm going to be. Is there any time that we recognize that survivors are some of the most powerful people on this planet? But I have to also say that if you're going to get out of an abusive situation, it's not as easy as it is to just get out. You have to have help, you have to have a safety plan, and you have to have experts be with you while you're working on that safety plan. Don't do it by yourself, and um, because your chances of being killed increase 75% when you're trying to get out of an abusive situation all by yourself without any help. Hi guys, um, I'm the last one, so I'm going to make this fast. I don't have a question, I'm just, I'm Ashley Erin Castro's oldest sister. My name is Ashley Rios, and I just wanted to let y'all know that we started a foundation in her name. It's Justice for Erin, and if you look it up online, it's justiceforerin.org. And um, we're actually going to be hosting a run in February 22nd. Um, our goal is to speak to high school and middle school students and let them know, tell Aaron's story, and let them know everything that has, is going on with domestic violence, because they are not home. They are going through it as well. Also, uh, we will be passing out scholarships uh, in her name as well. That's it. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all of you for coming out tonight, for staying over, for listening. I know this is not easy, and probably a bunch of us are traumatized, but we need to know these things, we need to hear these things, and hopefully they'll inspire us to change. Tonight, we're going to close out tonight's session with Congressman Castro saying a few words. Thank you so much. Again, I want to say thank you first to Patricio, Patricia, to Moms and Man, to all of the advocacy groups in Monta, who are here tonight and who are so helpful on these issues, particularly on domestic violence, and to the folks in law enforcement, to the mayor. The mayor had eye surgery today, but still was able to come and listen. Thank you. And to the, to the survivors of domestic abuse, we are sorry for what you went through. Nobody up here can take away the past and the pain. To the children, to the family members who witnessed those things and who lost loved ones, we grieve with you for your loss. And to a community that is affected by domestic violence. I know that I speak for myself, Congressman Doggett, Congressman Heard, all of the elected officials here when I say that we will do everything that we can in our power to change this. The first thing that I believe that we should do, it's clear that there is not enough organization in San Antonio to deal with this problem comprehensively. <laughs> what I, would like, I spoke to Lloyd as we, were, as we were here together. What I would like for us to do is to bring together elected officials at the different levels of government together 
the, the members of Congress on the federal level, the state legislators, members of the judiciary, the city council members, the members of the county commissioner's court, to sit together and listen to the advocates, to the survivors, and to others, and figure out how all of us working together can actualize the suggestions that you have for change. Because all of those suggestions have to be turned into laws or into funding to combat domestic violence. I want us as elected officials to come together at the different levels of government to sit and listen and work together and figure out how we can actualize change. For example, there are concrete things that we heard tonight. I want to take up a small one, but a very important one that was discussed. I don't know, and there may already be, but I don't know when you call the emergency line for the county or for the for SAPD, whether you can request that an officer come out who specifically speaks Spanish. You guys are able to do that, Chief? Are they able to do that? Okay, I hope that, that that has become routine, that that's systemic. But I want us to get together so that we can put in place very specific changes and make those things happen. And you have my commitment that we'll continue to work on these things and that we will do this again in short order so that we can listen to more survivors and so that we can give you an update on our progress. Thank you very much for being here.